Well, good morning, Walden Church. I'm sure you know that on February 13th, that'll be the Super Bowl. And so naturally, that means today, I'd like to talk to you about basketball. <laughs> uh, back in the 90s, David Robinson was the center for the San Antonio Spurs, but he wasn't the only good player on his team. The power forward was Tim Duncan. And I don't know if you remember, but San Antonio won the NBA playoffs in 1999, and Tim Duncan was their star player. And in a later edition of Sports Illustrated, David Robinson reflected on what that moment was like for him. He said, I can't overstate how important my faith has been to me as an athlete and as a person. It's helped me deal with so many things, including matters of ego and pride. For instance, I can't deny that it felt weird to see Tim standing on the podium with the finals MVP trophy. I was thinking, man, never have I come to the end of a tournament and not been the one holding up the trophy. It was hard. But I thought about the Bible story of David and Goliath. David helped King Saul win a battle, but the king wasn't happy because he had killed thousands of men while David had killed tens of thousands. So King Saul couldn't enjoy the victory because he was thinking about David getting more credit than he was. I'm blessed that God has given me the ability to just enjoy the victory. So Tim killed the tens of thousands. That's great, and I'm happy for him. Why did I read that to you this morning? Well, because I really don't think that sharing our faith comes naturally to most of us. And perhaps the reason why is because you, you share your faith, and then that puts you in a position of being vulnerable and putting yourself out there. On the one hand, the church should be telling, telling you always to evangelize and to share your faith. But the message from the world is, no, 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 keep your head down. And if you want to keep peace with everyone, you don't talk about politics or religion. So how do we do that? Can we please both the world and Jesus? Well, I guess the short answer is no. I I know we don't want to offend anyone, but if we're talking about the choice between heaven and hell, maybe it's time that we all got a little bit more offensive. Romans chapter 10 says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Paul says, how are people ever going to come to faith if nobody's preaching? And today in our passage of scripture, we're going to see how passionate Jesus is to send disciples out into the field. We're going to spend most of our time in Matthew chapter 10 today, but I want to go back and look at the bottom of Matthew chapter 9 first. Matthew 9 says, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We started in verse 35, and there it is again. Just like we saw last week, Matthew has a summary, a summary of what we read. Matthew says, Jesus had a ministry of teaching and preaching. And then the focus turns to Jesus's perspective. Jesus looks out over the crowds of people, people he's talking to, the crowds who are bringing him, the injured, the wounded, the outcast, the homeless, the sick, the injured, people who have always lived out on the outskirts of society, people starving for human contact. And the Bible says Jesus has compassion on them. Compassion is too nice of a word. Jesus looks on these people the same way a parent or a grandparent would look on their children. How would you feel if you were watching your own child starve? watching your own child suffer, watching your own child be injured. How would it feel for you physically to watch your child 
being bullied by another kid or being picked on, would you feel compassion? It's kind of the wrong word, isn't it? No, you would experience deep hurt. It would feel like there was a pain in your heart and it would give you a motivation to act. You would want to do something. You would do anything to take away that hurt or to take away that pain. You'd be motivated, right? No matter what the cost, you would take any risk. And the Bible says these people were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Can you imagine what shepherdless sheep look like? What, what would shepherdless sheep do? I mean, pretty much anything, right? They would, they, they would just be mindlessly wandering, drifting from one pleasure to the next, finding grass and consuming everything without restraint. And then when it was gone, they would just wander off to find more. Shepherdless sheep keep their heads down. They're not mindful of the enemy that prowls around them. Shepherdless sheep are fidgety and easily distracted, almost mindless consumers, unable to think for themselves. Jesus makes an observation, doesn't he, about our world? There are a lot of sheep, but only a few shepherds. Or to put it another way, there's a big harvest, but there's only a few to work it. Lots to do. Very few who will step up and do the work. I read a passage from Joel last week, so I thought it's only fitting that I read another passage from Joel for you today. Joel 3 says, Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The harvest is ripe. How ripe? Well, I mean, we can estimate right? We can estimate. Let's say there's uh, 7 billion people in the world, and that's a lot. You and I, we can't even fathom a number that big. It's hard for us to picture that. And out of that 7 billion, one third of the world says that they would check the box to say they're Christian. Now, whether they practice their faith or they understand what that means, we don't know. But one third of the world says they believe. Now, you and I, we're lucky because in Texas, uh, research shows that our state is 77% Christian. Utah has us beat, though. They, they are 1% more than we are. <laughs> and if I asked you what were the least Christian states, if you said, well, California, New York, you'd be wrong. They are not even in the top 10. Least was Maine. Maine was the least. Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Oregon, Alaska, Nevada. So that means if we agree then with Pew Research and say that you know, one third of the world is saved and that still leaves 4.5 billion people who are living every single day without Christ, 4.5 billion people on the earth that are going to hell. 4.5 billion people, we can't picture that. It's it's a million people four and a half thousand times. That's a lot of people who are not connected to the most important thing that they absolutely need to be connected to. So the subject matter for today is the most important subject and the one that we should be pursuing. I mean, if the world is filled with lost sheep and there are 4.5 billion people who need a shepherd, this is our job. I know that's a big number. We could make it a little smaller, right? We could make it a little smaller, okay? So Texas has 29 million people in it. And we said 77% are already Christian. Okay, good news. That means you only have 7 million more people left to go. <laughs> Jesus says that he's looking at those 7 million people in Texas. And he says, it's harvest time. And, and if you didn't grow up on a farm, harvest time means get out of bed. This is urgent. It's time to go to work. Ripe fruit needs to be picked quickly, either to eat or to store or to take to market. Harvest time is not slow, relaxed, wandering time. Harvest time is not a time to play games. It's not a time to put your feet up. It's not a time to take it easy. My uncle used to say, work comes first, then play. 
And if Jesus says his heart is broken for the lost, and there's still 7 million people in Texas who need Jesus, then we can't rest until the work is done. You and I were given a life down here, and we have a life of wealth and comfort and blessing, but let's not waste our lives with our feet up. Remember, when Jesus calls his disciples, he called them away from their own lives, right? And he says, now you're going to work for me. And they weren't going to work anymore to put food on their own table. Now they were going to work for the kingdom. And not one disciple made an excuse or debated that calling. The Bible says immediately they left their old life behind and they followed him. Why? Because even though they had a life, they could still see that following Jesus was a better one. You see, you and I, as sheep, we are always going to opt for the easy path. Our default is, I'm going to coast. Our default is comfort. And at first look at Jesus, we would say, no thanks. Right? If you had any sense, you would say, no thank you. A rebel rabbi who has no base of operations, no bed to sleep on. He breaks all the social and cultural laws. He touches the sick. He talks to women. He even lets women be his students. In fact, he's even let another woman, Joanna, payroll his entire ministry. I mean, I have a job. I know it's not much, but at least it pays the bills for right now. And, it, and the local government's leaving me alone. You know, Johnny Law is letting me work in peace. And you want me to leave all of that. And you want me to join a rebellion, a group that has no support and no allies on either side of government or religion. People will hate us. We'll be starving and we'll spend nights sleeping outside We'll have a life that's constantly on the move. The Bible says immediately, the disciples left their old life behind and followed. Why? Because there is no better life. <laughs> because anything else is a wasted life. It's a wasted pursuit. Look around you. Look at the empty seats around you. Last Sunday's attendance was 100 people less than before COVID, a hundred people. I know we're operating at a 50% capacity and we all know it's partially because of COVID, but we can't be comfortable with it. We have to stop making excuses for it. We have to, well, Jesus tells us what we have to do, right? He says, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus says, well, first, you pray. We recognize that we can do nothing on our own. So first, you pray. Pray for workers. Pray for harvest. Pray for evangelists. Pray for church growth everywhere. So, let's not talk about it. Let's not talk about it. Don't write it down in your sermon notes. Jesus tells us to do it. So let's do it. Let's pray. Lord, help us to see the lost as you do. Open the eyes of our hearts to see people from an eternal perspective. Give us the same compassion for the lost that Jesus felt when he looked upon shepherdless crowds. Continue to open doors for the gospel all around us, but Lord, also give us the attentiveness to recognize them. We often miss what you are doing around us because we are distracted by entertainment. We are numbed by sin. We are overwhelmed with our own schedule. But rather help us to see that every brief encounter is an opportunity arranged by you. Every moment is a moment of eternal meaning. The clerk at the checkout counter or the person next to us on the plane will no longer be just another person in our eyes, but someone that you have placed in our path. Give each one here the courage to proclaim the truth. Help us to put your kingdom first, our shyness last. We are ready to do your will. May each one here be a living sacrifice, desiring to be used in your mission 
We ask today for courage and direction. Amen. Jesus says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Where? Where is the harvest? Or better yet, where is your harvest field? Where is the Lord leading you? Where, where you work? Where you shop? Where you play? Where you live? Where you teach? Where you coach? All the stuff you do, you are sent out into the mission field. So wherever you go, begin to see it with new eyes. Remind yourself, I am not here for milk and eggs. Well, you are, but that's just your cover story. <laughs> I'm here for the kingdom. We have two wonderful outreach programs here at the church, Stephen Ministry and Grief Share. But what else? What else can we do? Where else can we reach? Who else needs us? Who else needs a touch? Could we do something with Alcoholics Anonymous? Could we do something with addiction? What other groups can we start? Who do we have a heart for? We need to be praying about it. If we go over to the beginning of Matthew chapter 10, it says, Jesus called to him 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First Simon, who was called Peter and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. You know, we saw last week, Matthew showed us that Jesus had authority, right? If you read Matthew 9, you see more examples of, uh, of that. And then here in Matthew 10, Jesus gives authority to the disciples. Jesus says, now you have authority. Now you represent me. Jesus rallies the troops, and then he gives them a command. He says, now you do the work. Here is your marching orders. You just see me preach and heal. You saw how I did it. You saw that for seven chapters, right? Five chapters. Now it's your turn. He just showed them what to do. And then he gives them the assignment. Training period over. <laughs> Jesus, we're not ready, right? Jesus, we're not ready. We don't, we don't know what to say. Uh, can we just have a couple more Bible studies first? Nope. But I didn't go to seminary. This is the pastor's job. What did, what did Jesus do when he called his 12 disciples? Who, who are these names? They're names of men who've already been rejected by rabbis. They're fishermen, they're zealots, they're tax collectors. So Jesus gives them instruction. Starting in verse 5, he says, These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without pay, acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics, or sandals, or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. In whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it, and if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it'll be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Jesus gives instructions, and they are simple, right? He says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Remember, Jesus had authority over the entire world, and now he gives the authority to them. And he says, go where the need is the greatest. Where should we go, Jesus? Go to where people are oppressed. Go to where people are lost. Go to where people are pushed to the fringes. Notice that he doesn't send them to easy people. He sends them to hard people. He sends them into the most areas where there is need. 
And then he says, you're going to be in a place that is in need and you are not going to bring with you excess. You are not even going to bring with you money. Why? Because Christ is sufficient and he's going to satisfy all their needs. Sounds scary, doesn't it? Sounds scary. Don't worry. It gets worse. Verse 16 says, Behold, I am sending you out as sh sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. What a bedside manner this Jesus guy has, doesn't he? Right? I, Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He reminds these 12, You're sheep. <laughs> and where am I sending you? Out into the wolves. That sounds dangerous. Yep. Jesus sends us out into danger. So why should we go? Because he's the shepherd and he provides and he protects and we go with his authority. He gives it to us and he promises never to leave us. More instruction in Matthew 10. Beware of men for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues and you'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. You follow Christ, and you follow him out into the danger. But, Jesus says, you are not going alone. Jesus says, you don't need to take anything with you, because I will provide all your physical needs. And then he says, and you don't even need to prepare what you are going to say. For all those excuses, I wouldn't know what to say. Jesus says, I will put the words in your mouth and it won't even be you speaking. Some of us don't want to evangelize because we think I don't have the words to say. And Jesus says, I have the words to say and I will say them for you. Verse 21 says, brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child and the children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Do you have this brother? Do I have this brother? Jesus promises the gospel will divide your family. It'll divide those closest to you. Does being a Christian save you from suffering? No. What does Jesus say? He says, you will be betrayed. You will be hated. And a little further down the page, it stresses this point in verse 34. He says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Didn't the world hate Jesus? The world killed Jesus. So it makes sense that if you are his follower and you are sent to do the work he does, if you are a sheep going out into a world of wolves, you will be hated too. We can do all kinds of nice deeds. We can do all kinds of acts of service and acts of charity, and they will all be well received. You will get pats on the back. But the moment you open your mouth and you say, I do all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, you will be hated. Matthew 10 says, and when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. I don't know, maybe, maybe you won't be persecuted. Maybe. But Jesus says, when? Right? He says, when they persecute you. Verse 24 says, the disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master, it is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? 
Jesus is our master. We follow him. So it stands to reason that whatever happened to Jesus will happen to us. Which is ironic, really. Because, I mean, we're down here and we're trying to live a safe, comfortable life. But that is not the life that Jesus calls us to. Jesus warned potential disciples last week. People came up to him and said, we will follow you. And Jesus said, are you sure you want to follow me? Because I don't even know where my next meal is coming from. I don't have a bed. I don't have a pillow. Jesus does not call us to safe Christianity. Don't settle for safe Christianity. Jesus calls us to follow. Where? Jump ahead to Matthew 16. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? We follow, right? Disciples follow. Follow him where? All the way to the cross. That's scary. Because that means death. I think Jesus says these words to his disciples and he can just see <laughs> their knees are knocking and their teeth are chattering. And so he reaches out and he tries to calm their nerves with these next words. He says, so have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the rooftops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are more valuable than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father, who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father, who is in heaven. Jesus knows that the fear you have is the biggest obstacle to sharing your faith. He knows. Jesus knows that fear is that biggest obstacle to you raising your hand and volunteering. Jesus knows that fear is the biggest obstacle you have when someone says, can you lead a Bible study? Can you teach a Sunday school class? Your biggest obstacle is fear. Jesus says, fear not. How many times? Three times, right? Fear not. Why? Because this is temporary. This is all temporary. That's his assurance. His assurance to you is, why are you afraid? This is all temporary. He says, have no fear of them for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. He says, you need an eternal perspective. You need to see things from the eternal perspective. Remember, Paul, last week, he called this world a slight momentary affliction. Amen? This is a slight momentary affliction. You live for heaven, not this temporary mortal world. Jesus says, so proclaim it. Proclaim it from the rooftops. I mean, after all, he says, you know, the only thing they can take from you is your life. <laughs> That's what I'm afraid of. Paul says in Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Right? To die is gain. So we need some eternal perspective. Don't fear. Don't fear. You have a heavenly father which means you have heavenly protection. In fact, let's run down the list of the most common fears, all right? Number one, I'll be all by myself. I can't do this alone. That's not true. Discipleship is relational. To be obedient to the Great Commission, you have to be disciples who are making disciples for Jesus, which means we can't do this without you. We can't do this without the body. You're not alone. You need the support and structure of the church. This is not about you against the world. Otherwise, what are we all doing here? You're not alone. 
Second, evangelism is too hard. I mean, let's let the paid professionals do it. That's why we hire pastors. That's also not true. Evangelism is actually not so complicated. Remember, fishermen and tax collectors who had no formal theological training did it thousands of years ago, and they didn't even have the entire Bible on their phone. You could say, well, evangelism isn't my spiritual gift. While it is true that there is a spirit of evangelism, Jesus never said that only some of us were called to do it. The gospel is good news, and good news can't be kept quiet. You could also say, you know what, I'm just so busy, I don't have time for evangelism. Technically, we make time for anything that we think is important. Everyone is busy. Busy is, is an excuse, because right now, we all think we have time for TV. We all have time for social media. We all have time to play. We all have time for hobbies. We all have time to read the newspaper. We have no time for discipleship, no time for evangelism. We have to value the things of God. We have to make room for evangelism. Seven million people in Texas need Jesus. And they need Jesus more than you need to catch up on episodes from Yellowstone or Emily in Paris. Number six, well, discipleship can just happen naturally through Christian fellowship. Mm, no, discipleship is intentional. It's time invested in people, and it's done on purpose. That's how Jesus did it. Jesus didn't tell his disciples, you know what, just walk around aimlessly and just, let's just see who signs up for Bible study. No, he told them exactly where to go. He gave them targets. Matthew 24, 14 says, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. How will the gospel be proclaimed? Jesus says, by everyone, right? This was his last command prior to his ascension in heaven. You and I, we are to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. And we have to take that seriously because he is expecting the church to grow, not shrink. But what about COVID? Who has authority over COVID? You are the witnesses. You have witnessed what God has done in your life. And you know that story. You are an expert at that story. So tell that story. You are the only one with that story. You are the evangelist. You are the missionary. You are the disciple that God has placed in that mission field. Where? Where will the gospel be proclaimed? The Bible says everywhere. Right? Matthew 24 says, in the whole world. Mark 16 says, he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. 4.5 billion people need to hear our stories. This is the task. And this task doesn't see race, doesn't see gender, doesn't see political lines. Jesus doesn't care if you agree with them or not. Jesus sent his first disciples out as sheep among wolves. Jesus sent his disciples first into the thick of it. That was the mission field. Seven million people in Texas are waiting for us. Each church, each church needs to stop competing for congregants. Each denomination needs to stop building walls and they need to start working together. We as Christians need to stop fighting and arguing with each other about anything. And we need to work together. Why? For evidence. The Bible says evidence. Matthew 24 says, for a testimony to all the nations. Unity among us further proves who he is. All people have an equal chance of hearing the good news. And all people have an equal chance of hearing and responding to the gospel message when we all work together. And if we can do this, if we can see the mission, if we can work in unity, then it will be the end. 
Matthew 24 says, and then the end will come. Today there are so many groups all around the world trying to restore back the beauty of the earth to its original creation. There's one group and they're out there and they're caring for the animals. And there's another group that's caring for plants and there's another group that's caring for marine life. And there's others that are saying, well, we gotta worry about the ecosystem. But the Bible reminds us that even though we do have a call to care for the earth, at the same time, we also know that one day it'll be gone. One day God will make a new earth and a new heaven and those places will be perfect, and those places will be your home. So until that day, the only thing of importance, the only thing of value, the only thing that's worth your life is getting people from this side of the line to that side of the line. And that's on all of us. And it starts right here with us, with each empty pew, with each empty classroom, with each vacant volunteer position. How then will they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This is the mission, and you are the body of Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this calling, even though it scares us and shakes us, and we question, where do I go? Who do I speak to? Lord, help us to see the mission field right in front of us. Help us to see the names and faces of those who need this in their lives. May each one here find a mission, find evangelism, find a way to tell their story boldly and from the rooftops. May we boldly shout your name. May we give credit where credit is due. May we tell each one, where our blessing comes from and why we live the way we live. May we no longer be afraid of the division it might cause between us and those we love because it is because we love them that we share this story. Lord, we pray for those lost in the city of Montgomery. We pray for those who are lost in the state of Texas. We pray for those who are lost in the United States. We pray for those who are lost in the world. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Hey, thank you for coming out and joining us today. Thanks for being here, thanks for watching. Of course, I wanna remind you that we are here, the church is here, not online. The church is a fellowship and it's meant to be experienced without fear. The Lord will watch over you. The Lord protects you. The Lord saves you. The Lord is your salvation. You need to be with your brothers and sisters. You need to be with people who love you and want to hold you and tell you and encourage you and share with you and extend grace to you. We have our story to tell, and we want to hear your story. Walden Community Church is open every Sunday for two services, one at 9.30. We have a traditional service, and we have a choir, and we sing the hymns that you grew up with. We also have an 11 o'clock service, which is more contemporary. We have a worship band, and we also have an hours program with our children and our youth. We also have a youth event on Wednesday, and we have a uh, our campus open to anyone from sixth grade through high school. And we'll even feed them dinner. You can send your kids over on their skateboard or their bike, or they could just walk over. We're really only 10 minutes away. And we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. And you don't even have to attend to send your kids. We want to see your kids. We want them to have the same community that we extend to you. Let's build a family together. 
Let's build a community together, a community that loves each other and loves the Lord. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.